Good morning to everyone and welcome. Um, this is our 10th season of the Prime Time at the BU Library. And Prime Time celebrates the experiences and the accomplishments of Bethel faculty, students, and staff. And it's a collaborative project between the Friends of the BU Library, faculty development, and other offices on campus. If you enjoy the Prime Time uh, programming, please consider becoming a member of the Friends. More information can be found on the library website. We record most of the programming, and you can catch up on all the prime times you missed this summer. They're linked to, on the library website under the BU Digital Library. Join us again next fall in our new time slot at 11.15 on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. Today is the last prime time of the year, and we welcome assistant campus pastor and doctoral candidate Jason Stephan Hagen, Hagen, sorry, Hagen. Hagen. okay. Um, as he explores the important connection between crisis of relationship as it relates to how college students take ownership of faith. Let's welcome Jason. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, really appreciate all of you being here. Um, this is, uh, as you mentioned, I'm a doctoral candidate, so this is the research that I've been doing for my dissertation, and I uh, just wanted to I was invited to share about it, and so I'm excited to do so today. Um, some of you are familiar with the process of research, and so we'll be kind of trekking through that kind of in the middle of this presentation. Others of you are not familiar with the process of dissertation research, and so I hopefully will be doing uh, presenting it in such a way that you'll feel like I'm not moving too quickly, but if you feel like it's moving a little fast and I'm using words like quantitative and qualitative and that doesn't make sense, it's okay, just, just hang with us for a little while. Um, the other thing I want to do is not only just explain what I've been doing and what I've done and, and what, what I think is meaningful about this research, but also to be somewhat reflective. And so giving all of us an opportunity to kind of take a uh, portion of this research and to learn from it. So hopefully you'll walk away from this, um, yeah, feeling like you're, you're able to put it into practice a little bit, not just hear about it. Um, and so that's what the handout kind of will help you do. So there's some initial questions which we can... Um, jump to here and I just kind of want us to open up with these questions so take four minutes or five minutes or so and just kind of reflect on these questions if you have a pen write them down um, if you have a laptop or something if you want to take notes on there you feel free to do so but who have been the biggest influences on your faith development journey thus far like who are those people that you would say have most impacted your journey maybe it's parents maybe it's a youth pastor maybe it's a mentor maybe it's your peer group um, there's a lot of different influences. Maybe it's a, an institution, maybe it's your home church, or maybe it's Bethel. Um, but what are the, 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 the people or the institutions that have most impacted or influenced your faith journey? The second question is why? Why were they so influential? What, what, is, what was it that they did that made that, that, that piece of, their, of the relationship they had with you so impactful? Um, so what was the, why was there such influence? Then three, um, what are some spiritual practices or resources that have helped you the most on your journey? Maybe what, what are some books that you've read, some maybe sermons that you've heard. Maybe, it's, um, maybe it is a relationship, so maybe a resource that you've had is, is a relationship. So what are some of the, the resources that have most impacted you? And then finally, what events in your life would you consider spiritual turning points? Um, like what were those moments where you realized the trajectory of how I view faith and how faith is informing my identity like I'll never go back from this moment like now that you're able to maybe, you know you probably didn't know it in the middle of it uh, maybe you did but maybe you didn't and now as you look back you're you're thinking man that moment that conversation that experience that that crisis that that conversation late at night with the roommate um, that was a moment that that changed things for forever um, and, I, and I'll never be the same person again. And those can be both positive or they could be a negative event. Um, sometimes um, it can go either way. So go ahead and take a couple minutes, reflect on those things, and then, and then we'll dive in.
So as you're still reflecting, feel free to continue to do so, but I'm going to start telling you a little bit about how I got to this point um, of doing my doctorate and, and being passionate about this research. So a little personal backstory on me. Um, I grew up not too far from here, Maple Plain, Minnesota, went to Orno High School, came to Bethel right after, after high school. Um, loved my four years here, um, but Bethel, it was a great place for me. I learned a lot, I engaged a lot, had some really great relationships, but Bethel was a lot like home for me, and it, and it didn't, I didn't allow it to push me. I, I, sometimes I say it didn't push me, but that's not, that's not the case. Bethel would have pushed me if I had allowed it to, if I had engaged with it in the way that would have been more meaningful, um, more impactful, more challenging. It would have changed me more, but I walked away from here feeling almost even more confident in what I thought I knew um, than when I came. And, and I didn't allow it to really hit me as hard and, and be the transformative place that it could have been. So my wife and I got married shortly after graduation. We moved down to Tennessee. And moving to Tennessee, moving to the South, going to a different, working at a different university, having some struggle trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life job-wise, um, and just learning what it meant to be in relationship um, with a woman in bed next to me and with, you know, now sharing a room. Like, <laughs> I was suddenly struck by a lot of different challenging experiences, and that forced me to ask a lot of interesting questions about what I believed. And then I started doing a lot of reading, a lot of, a lot of reading. Actually, I was looking at the books on this shelf, and I was noticing a lot of the books that I spent a considerable amount of time investing in that really helped me start the questioning process. I noticed up here Velvet Elvis by Rob Bell. I noticed um, Beyond Cheap Grace by uh, Biafagne. And those are two of the books that really helped get me thinking and get me recognizing the world was a little bit different than maybe the kind of conservative, evangelical, uh, suburban world that I had grown up in, graduated from, and was now thinking was the entirety of the universe. And, um, and so a lot of different pieces of my faith journey started to come alive through reading. Um, and then this understanding of what the kingdom of God was, it kind of was introduced through some of this reading, this idea of the already but not yet kingdom of God kind of hit me. And that, that's the idea, I'm going to put it in a really small nutshell that we don't have time to unpack, the idea that Jesus came to establish and to set up and to kind of initiate the kingdom of God, but not yet is it being fully realized. So already we are experiencing pieces of heaven, already we are experiencing the ever after, but not yet is it fully realized, which clearly we all know that. We can look around the world and see the difficulty of it, but yet we can also see beauty and hope, and we know that Christ is risen and that Christ will return. And so there's this idea of it's already here, but not yet is it fully realized actualized and and that really started that that idea that principle that theology started to really impact me and got me really thinking critically about okay then what is life all about what's my purpose what's the meaning uh, Dr. Osgood talks a lot about the well-being wheel and the bottom of the wheel top of the wheel is spiritual life and then the bottom of the wheel is meaning making and I think this this idea of, of the already but not yet got me thinking a lot about okay what is where am I finding meaning in my life especially if the kingdom of God is a present reality what is that calling me to right here, right now? Um, and then the third thing, and, and this is just obviously a summary of my life, but um, is our adoption journey towards our son. Um, we adopted our son, he's seven years old now, but when he was uh, six months old, we went to Ethiopia and we were able to bring him home. And uh, that journey was a beautiful journey, a difficult journey, um, but it, and it raised a lot of questions about what does it mean to be a parent? What does it mean to be... A, a person of faith? Um, what does it mean to, um, to have this other life that you're responsible for? What does it mean to love in a way that is completely self-giving? Um, and it was, a, it was a, like I said, a beautifully hard journey, um, but it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, one that, um, that my wife and I often talk about is changing us daily. Um, and, and so it's been a, a great part of our, our story that is continuing to challenge us um, in, our, in our own faith development. A couple other things that forced me, uh, kind of, or put me in this position, is that I got a master's in theology. I was really interested to learn more. I'm, I'm kind of a nerd um, by trade. I, I like reading fantasy novels, especially Lord of the Rings. I read it not as much as Bilby, but read it quite a bit. Um, and I, I really wanted to know the intellectual pursuit of who God was. I wanted to know the whys of the faith. Um, and I also wanted to take those, kind of being a practitioner, being a like having a pastoral heart, I wanted to take the whys of the faith, the theology of the faith, and try to help others get into that without it being threatening, without it having to be ivory tower all the time. 
Um, and so I wanted to get a theology degree and just got, I just got enraptured by it. Loved reading Brueggemann and Karl Barth, uh, James Cohn, Gutierrez, Johnson, Wolfman. I mean, these are some of my favorites, um, some that will definitely have prominent spaces on the shelf in the office. And uh, so once again, reading was a big part of this journey. Um, but then also the dialogue with professors and being in class. And I mean, one of my favorite professors, we played intramural football together. And so, you know, we'd be throwing touchdown passes and then we'd be talking about Karl Barth on the way back to the, you know, the car or something. And it was just a fun experience to be kind of in, in this, uh, this mix of, of theology and relationship. And then finally, as I was working at, at Lee University at the time down in Tennessee, we were establishing a discipleship program um, kind of from the ground up. They had a grant that they hired me under and they didn't have a lot of structure to their program and so I was able to take my experience at Bethel as an undergrad and was able to kind of create some foundational materials, some job descriptions, and then to really build off that because I kind of knew the kind of the how-to's or the, or the what's of the discipleship program. I knew we had to have this person in place, and then this person in place, and then this person, and we would kind of do it this way, but I didn't really know why, didn't really know how, I just started doing it. And, and then I had a, a really great mentor of, of mine, uh, Dr. Mike Hayes, who was the, at that time was Assistant Vice President um, for Student Life, and then became the Vice President for Student, student Development at Lee. Uh, he was a great mentor that really introduced me to a lot of different developmental theories. And so I started learning all about faith theory, uh, through Fowler, who's become my personal favorite faith theorist, um, James Marcia, Erickson Colbert, Chickering, Baxter Magolda, uh, Alexander Aston with his IEO model. I mean, just all these different things that were helping us understand um, how it is that we develop as human beings, whether it's from a cognitive place, behavioral place, moral place, faith place, identity formation, um, and then how environments um, impact the way that we develop. And so I was just getting lost in all of this and um, really enjoying it. And all of that, my own my own personal journey, my own um, intellectual journey, and then this, this kind of practical putting together a program uh, for discipleship and, and utilizing all these different developmental aspects kind of led me to this, this, this place in my, in my education where when it came time to do a doctorate, the, the kind of the, the obvious choice when it came to time for dissertation was, was kind of asking the question, how are college students doing this? How are they taking ownership of their faith? What does that look like? How do we, how do we nail it down? We kind of have some ideas. We can kind of look at faith development theory and kind of go, okay, maybe there. We can look at a little identity formation. We can kind of, okay, maybe it's that. But I, I wanted to really go, okay, what if we put these things together? What if we started kind of seeing how this, this there's an interconnection between identity formation and, 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 and our psychosocial development and our faith development theory? And what if we could kind of hone in on what are the principles behind a college student taking ownership of their faith. And so one of the things I needed to establish really quickly was is, there, is, is it biblical to have faith development? Like is, does faith develop or is faith just like, you know, you say the sinner's prayer and then suddenly you're a mature Christian? Now I think we all might laugh at that, but I don't, I don't think that's far off from how some people would view um, faith maturity. It, it's, it's almost like we just expect sanctification to happen right away. Um, when that's just not, I don't think that's how the Bible describes it. Uh, but the Bible doesn't just come out and say that. It doesn't just say, you know, you know, you're going you're gonna to have to go through a really hard process. I mean, it does, I mean, but it's more in stories, and it's more nuanced than that. And so I, I wanted to dive into Scripture to figure out, okay, what does the Bible have to say about developmental faith? Um, how does identity formation, like I said, these, these other types of, uh, of development theories, I wanted to know, is there an interaction? Is there a connection between them? Um, and one of, the, one of the things that I really loved doing was seeing identity and self-authorship theory connect to faith development theory. I think there's a lot that we can learn in faith development from these other, these other areas. Um, and then can we measure a person's faith maturity? This was a question we had to ask. If we're going to discover how a person becomes mature in their faith, we first have to be able to define what does mature faith look like, and, and can we actually like, point at it and say, oh, yeah, that person has a mature faith. Let's learn from them. Uh, and so I had to, dis had to figure out, is there a measure, is there, a, is there some assessment that we can utilize to, to check that out? And, or is that going to be the dissertation, is creating one? Um, and thankfully I didn't have to. Uh, I found one that, that was reputable and, and, and would work. Um, and then finally, what factors then contribute to a mature faith? Um, and, and so that was the big question that came next. Some presumptions, because all good research, you have to have some prevailing presumptions that you are just assuming. Um, and so the couple that I had, that this, there's more than this, but kind of the two big ones for today's presentation, is that faith is more than just what we are cognitively believing. That it's, so there's a relational dynamic to our faith. 
And I think that's, we grow up hearing that, we grow up hearing that we have a relationship with Jesus, have a relationship with Jesus, but yet, oftentimes the way our faith is presented to us, it's presented as, here are the do's, here are the don'ts, here's the checklist, here are the things you don't want to check, and if you do this and you don't do that, then you're going to be good, or if you believe these certain things, well then you're, you're set, and you're fine, and you don't need to worry about things. And I, and I think it's much more complicated than that, or maybe much more simple than that, right? Jesus talked about his yoke being easy and his burden being light. When you have, in light of the Pharisees who have 612 rules that people have to follow, and Jesus comes along and says, it's all about relationship. If you know me, you know the Father. That yoke suddenly becomes a lot easier. Even though we all know that relationships are complicated, at least we're not having to do all the rules. We don't have to worry about those because when we're in a love-filled relationship, the rules end up taking care of themselves. And I think that's one of the prevailing mysteries and beauties of, of what Jesus is after. Um, and then secondly, a mature faith is one in which a person is taking ownership of that faith. And so it's no longer um, a reflection of someone else's faith. It's no longer what my parents told me, my youth pastor told me, Pastor Laurel told me in chapel, I heard at a prime time. Um, it's now, I've thought about this, I've wrestled with this, I'm owning this, and this is how I'm going to live my life is from this place because this is what I believe is true and this is the grounding of where I'm going to live my life from. Uh, and, I, and I think those are some of the hallmarks of what a mature faith looks like. Okay, so those are some of the, the presumptions. Then we dive into the biblical and theological review. So the way that we were asked to write a dissertation is you kind of do your intro with your presumptions, assumptions, and those kinds of things. Then you have to do a biblical and theological review, a literature review, then your field research. So I'm going to kind of walk through this, hopefully, quickly, and it'll make sense. Um, I had to kind of hone in the Bible, because when you're writing a dissertation, you've got to do a more of a deep dive as opposed to a surface level dive. And so I had all these ideas about um, all the different areas of scripture that I wanted to cover. Um, and uh, my advisor's here, Katie, and she gave me some wonderful advice. She said, you need to pick a couple, uh, because you're, you're not going to be able to do an exhaustive look at all of this. It's going to turn into way more pages than you want to write. And so I chose two primary scriptures um, for my research. I chose Deuteronomy 6.5, which is also known as the Shema. Hear o, Israel, hear, o Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Um, and the reason why I chose this is, is that idea of, of one is the idea of love. I, I wanted to understand in a deeper way what, what, what were they getting at when they talked about God being love and God wanting us to to be connected to him in love, and that God loves us. Like that, that idea of love, to me, what, I mean, we kind of, you know, we talk about it a lot, obviously, because it's such a foundational principle, but that's why I want to dive into it, because it's so foundational, and I think we've turned love into a transaction as opposed to a relationship, and so I wanted to really dive into what does love look like, and the, the key place to do that wasn't just to talk about it emotionally, but to dive into this Hebrew word of heart. And if you, if you know the Hebrew language at all, you know that there are far less words in Hebrew than there are in English. In English, we have, I think it's upwards of 40 to 50,000 words. And in Hebrew, there's closer to six, 7,000 words, maybe even less than that. And, and the thing that happens in Hebrew is that words take on multiple meanings. And so if you know the, the reflective scripture that Jesus uses in the New Testament, there's a word added to the sequential of how we love God. It's with our with our heart, with our soul, with our strength, and with all of our mind. And that's not used in the Hebrew. That's because in Hebrew, the word heart has a, has a, has a multiple meaning to it. It's, it's, a, it's a heart mind. It's an intellect of will, emotions, passions. It's basically with your entire being, you are called to love God. And, and so a couple of the things that came out of researching this passage in Deuteronomy were first that this is, this is definitely relational. Like we cannot do this outside of relationship. Love, by its definition, is relational. Love has to have an object to love. And so, therefore, there's a relational dynamic going on that we can't ignore. And then secondly, it's all of us. There isn't a part of us that we can, like, not give over to this. So it's our entire identity, our entire being has to be involved in this love relationship. So it really, I think, sets the foundation for the importance of this whole endeavor. The second passage that I chose is one of my kind of life verses, and it's Romans 12, 2. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you can test and approve God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. And I loved this passage because this is the transition point. This is the hinge point for Paul when in his writing to the Romans where it goes from explaining all of his theology 
and now he's about to get practical with that theology. And the way he does that is by helping us understand the importance <coughs> of this transformation of who we are, and it, it involves our thinking. And, and for me, when I, the reason why I honed in on the Deuteronomy passage being heart-mind, and I focused on this passage having to do with changing our thinking, is because I believe that in our thinking, our cognitive development, is where there's develop is where we where there is development going on. So when we ask the question, is the Bible developmental? I think these two passages point directly to it because they're involving our emotions and our passions, but also our intellect and our will. And those are cognitive things that we have a role in. Um, and so there's a developmental process going on when we talk about these things. Um, and so, so this idea of, of transitioning between orthodoxy and orthopraxy, right beliefs to right actions, and then the co-authorship of the Holy Spirit and us. Like, we are intimately involved in this. One of the, the passages, or one of the authors that I read that talked about this passage in Romans 12, talked about how, yes, the transformation process is done by the Holy Spirit, but you don't, you don't just sit by and wait for it to happen and expect it to happen. You have to be a player. Like, you have to step up and be involved in this. You have to think, and you have to, to choose, and you have to act, and it's, it's all intermixed. So it's not just, you know, playing, uh, you know, backup pilot and letting, you know, oh, you know, Jesus take the wheel kind of thing. No, no, it's like, you got a wheel, Jesus got a wheel, and when you're cranking to the right, sometimes he's cranking to the left, and then you got to figure out, okay, how do we drive this thing well together? Um, because it's both of you doing this. Um, all right, so at, and one of the one of the great verses that uh, popped out, or one of the great when in research, one of the things you're looking for is like perfect like quotes <laughs> because they just make everything come together. And when I found this one, I was in the seminary library. I, I think I literally shouted out loud like, "Yeah!" Uh, because I couldn't imagine a better transition point between Deuteronomy and, and Romans than this. Deuteronomy six four through five is the Old Testament equivalent of Romans twelve one and two. As is true for us in ancient Israel, the truly godly were covenantally committed to him in their inner beings, with their entire bodies, and with their, all their resources. Paul and Moses are on the same page. At that point in the margin, I just wrote, and I'm done. Um, <laughs> but that wasn't going to sell, so I had to keep going. But, I mean, this is, to me, this was just such a great connection point between the developmental process, our entirety of who we are, and how these verses really line up. Um, with kind of explaining the nature of relationship with God and, and how we grow in our faith. Okay, so moving on to the literature review. As I mentioned earlier, Fowler is my favorite, James Fowler. Um, so I'm going to give you a really quick synopsis, and this is where if you want to take notes on this, you're welcome to. Uh, but if you want to grab coffee later on and talk more, we definitely can because we're going to run out of time. Um, so Fowler has a six-stage theory of, of faith formation. Um, really quickly, the first stage of faith formation is when you're like four years, six years old and younger. And it's when everything that you can imagine is awesome, real, and totally happening. So the Easter Bunny, Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy, Grandma and Grandpa, Jesus, God, Daniel and the Lion's Den, all of it is real because you've heard all of it and you'll think it's all awesome. And so you just, you love it all and everything makes sense. But then suddenly, Concrete operational thought kicks in around five, six, seven years old, and you start to realize, okay, what I can see, touch, feel, smell, hear, those, are, those things are more real than other things. But my parents are really convinced that Jesus is real, so I'm going to like try to figure out how that makes sense. And so what we do is we go into this, this logical, rational type of way of explaining, the, explaining everything. So that's when Santa Claus suddenly becomes not real. Sorry to break it to some of you. That's when the tooth fairy becomes mom and dad because there's no way the fairy's getting in here because mom and dad locked the house up. Santa Claus can't come down a chimney because guess what? We live in a two-bedroom apartment. We don't even have a chimney. So like, they start to think rationally. But then they, they have this Bible and these stories, and they're like, okay, how does this make sense? Because a guy getting thrown into a den full of lions that are hungry you don't survive that, but yet the Bible says it is, and mom and dad say this is true. It's not just a made-up story like Santa Claus, so how do we do this? And so they start to think up rational explanations, right? They hear there was an angel maybe in there, and they go, oh, angels are really powerful. So there was an angel that sat on one line and then held the mouth shut of the other ones, which allowed Daniel to survive, right? They think of a rational reason for it. And this is what Fowler talks about as kind of the first naivete, thinking that you can actually solve all of these things. What ends up happening is that these... A child has this, a sense of narcissism, right? They think they can figure it all out. 
Well, what happens is that they start to get a little bit older and all their explanations for things start to kind of drift away. They start to realize, okay, that doesn't really hold up anymore. Uh, I probably need to come up with a better reason for that. And so what they do is they, they move into a, a phase where it's called stage three. And this is an externally driven stage of faith development where basically they, they look around and they say, who are the people in my life that I can really count on? Who are the people in life that I think make the most sense when, when they talk about faith? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out from them and trust them. So that's when they turn to mom and dad. That's when they turn to a youth pastor. That's when they turn to their friends. That's when they turn to a, a professor or, a, high, or a, a, a teacher at school. And they start to say, okay, I agree with these things. They also agree with institutions, churches, schools, uh, larger things, maybe even media. What is the media saying about this part of who I am or this part about what I believe? Um, and then finally... Um, you can also turn to authors, right? So you, you, you have an author that you really love, and you start to read everything they wrote, and you just agree with everything they've ever said because they clearly know what they're talking about. And there's nothing wrong with this stage of faith. This is a really healthy stage. What you're doing is you're building a foundation for what, where your thinking is starting from. And so this is a really important step. The problem is, is that mo a lot of people get stuck here. They, they kind of get into this, this way of thinking, and then they start to think that it's their thinking. Uh, but really, it's everyone else's. And so they get stuck here thinking that they've, they've arrived at some um, uh, place in their faith, but really, um, they're, they're just being influenced um, by, other, by other people and other things outside of them. And so what happens in Fowler's writing is that there's a transition between stage three and stage four. And this is the important one for college students. The, the important transition is that you're introduced to disequilibrium and crisis. A lot of times it happens when we leave home, we leave the comforts of our surroundings. As I mentioned in my journey, leaving home and coming to Bethel wasn't much of a change. I grew up in a conservative evangelical church with conservative evangelical friends, came to a fairly conservative evangelical college. And I, I didn't go looking for disequilibrium, for crisis, for difference. Instead, I kind of just hunkered down and stayed in these close, safe environments and relationships. It wasn't until I moved to Tennessee where I was suddenly kind of confronted by difference, confronted by disequilibrium and crisis, and was like, oh, I really have to answer some of this because I have no idea anymore what's going on. Um, and so hopefully what we're doing at Bethel is we're introducing you to some of this, this stuff. We're introducing you to crisis and disequilibrium because what it does is it forces you to ask the question, okay, what do I actually think? What do I actually believe? Who am I actually? What are, where am I really finding meaning? What do I really want to do with my life? And what's the grounding for doing those types of things? And that's where stage four comes in. It's more of an, an internal reflective faith. It's where you take personal ownership. The second identity, theor uh, identity theorist that I want to mention is James Marcia. James Marcia has this kind of cool um, uh, identity um, chart, graph, I forget what it, what it, anyway, whatever it's called. Anyway, and he has these four stages of identity formation. The first one is diffusion, second is foreclosure, moratorium achievement. Um, diffusion is when you have a low sense of crisis in your life and you also don't have a lot of commitments. You don't really know what the foundation is for what you, who you are, what you believe. You kind of are just floating along and you're just kind of like, yeah. Um, and I, I think actually growing up in a postmodern generation, this is a lot more where students are starting um, as, as we get further and further along, um, is that more and more don't know what their foundation is, and they haven't really experienced a ton of crisis in their life yet, and so they kind of just say yes to everything. So you sit in a theology class, and someone introduces you to Calvinism, Arminianism, and then open theism, and you're kind of like, yeah, I like it. And you're like, well, which one? All of them. Well, they're really different. Yeah, but they all sound great. Okay, you're totally diffused, right? Make a commitment. Which one are you going with for now? Okay. A lot of students grow up, though, in a foreclosed state where they are handed a very specific way of understanding the world, where they formed a lot of their beliefs, their parents have handed it to them, their pastors handed it to them, whoever, their friend group has handed it to them. And so they come in really committed to something, but they haven't really tested it yet. And hopefully college, hopefully relationships, hopefully being exposed to difference is going to force some crisis. But what happens is that when we get forced into some crisis, the commitment kind of wanes a little bit. We're like, I don't know about this whole faith thing anymore. I don't know about Calvinism anymore because I just read Boyd and my mind got exploded. Right? Or I don't know about you know, being Arminius because I just read some Piper and like that sounds really, really good too. So suddenly you're in a place of moratorium where you're starting to question all of this and starting to wonder about all of this. And that's really, really healthy, Marcy would say. Moratorium is a great space to be in. 
but we need to stay committed so that we can arrive at a place of achievement. We can, and I would I always try to insert the word ownership in, in, in place of achievement, where we have journeyed through crisis, and we're still engaged with the questions. The questions don't go away just because we're asking them or we think we've solved them, but instead we stay engaged with those questions, and we maintain some commitment so that we can be in a place of feeling like, okay, now I know who I am, now I know what I believe, or now I know more about myself, those kinds of things. Finally, um, I want to bring up Baxter Magolda, Marsha Baxter Magolda, and self-authorship theory. One of the cool things about this is it ties in so beautifully with the other two theories. She talks about the development of the internal voice, right? You can kind of hear Fowler's stage four in this, the development of the internal voice. And what she talks about is we need to go through some shadow lands and pain. It's when we kind of journey off the path a little bit, and we enter into this equilibrium and crisis, and that's a healthy place to be. But we can't live there forever. Instead, we need to form partnerships that allow us to journey and process through our faith. And so one of the fun things that I got to do is, as I was working with students, I got to take aspects of all three of these and weave them into my open-ended questionnaire, which I'm going to get to in just one second, um, to, talk, to figure out how are we taking ownership of our faith. Okay, so let's dive into the field research. This is the, this is the fun part. This is when I got to work with a whole group of students and really, really figure this stuff out. So really quickly for the nerds among us, grounded theory approach to research. Grounded theory is kind of a, is a theory of research where the, you, you allow the data to kind of emerge over the course of time as opposed to coming up with a theory and then testing it. So what I did is um, I had three stages of research and I allowed each of those stages to kind of impact me and, and determine what the next stage was going to look like uh, because I didn't want to assume too much. Um, and so that's one of the biggest things is that you need to be willing to be surprised when you're doing grounded theory research. I also did a mixed methods approach where I did some quantitative, so numbers-based research, and then qualitative, more open-ended questions and hearing people's stories and, and kind of mining out uh, pieces and, and commonalities and themes and principles from people's stories. And so it's more of a, uh, of a, a, a kind of a, like I said, a qualitative approach, um, kind of hearing the stories. Okay, so those are, that's the, that's the methodology and that's the approach. So, the first thing I used was the, the faith development scale. This was the part where I said, is anyone able to test a person's maturity? And this is what I found, is that there's a, a, a simple eight question faith development uh, survey that's reputable and, and has been validated and, and tested. Um, it's not perfect. There's areas that it doesn't do. Like it doesn't, like it's, it was meant to determine where you land on Fowler's stage theory. So are you a stage three? Are you a stage four? Are you a stage five? It doesn't do that. It, it really tests, do you have a mature faith or do you not? And where are you on a maturity sense within your faith? And that's what I really wanted to know. I didn't need to know if you're a three or four or five. I wanted to know if you're mature or not. And so that's what this, this was actually tested and, and shown and valid to do. So I gave that out to 210 student leaders in 2015. 92 of them took it, and 27 of them qualified for the next stage of the research, research by scoring an eight out of, a six out of eight or better on, on the scale. Then we moved into the qualitative portion. The qualitative portion was seven open-ended items based on the theories of Fowler, Marcia, and Baxter Magola, which I just talked about. I gave it out electronically. 27 students, the 27 that qualified for it, were then given this uh, open-ended questionnaire, and 14 of them completed the entire questionnaire. So what I did is I took those responses, and I did a fun thing called coding and counting, which is a really kind of mind-numbing, long process of going through every response and giving it a value. So if you said, for instance, to a question on um, who were the people that have impacted your faith journey? If you, said, if you said a parent, well, that got a one. And then every other time parent came up, it got a one next to it. So then I was able to count the number of times parent was said. If you said a friend, that got a number two, and so on. And you just kind of add it all up. And it looks like, like this. So reasons why partners were significant, this is one of my favorite charts, uh, is that I, these were some of the responses that I got, right? So provide encouragement and support, available for questions, they were challenging, offer unique perspective, offer prayer, respect the longevity of, of their faith, they have a similar faith journey to me. And then I took these and I divided them into two categories. They provided a space to process and they provided a specific direction for, for what I should do. And so you were able to, I was kind of able to kind of parse them out a little bit to create some, some categories of how this would look. In some instances, I was able to take the categories and create subcategories. And so you can see here, 
that how do you strengthen your internal voice? Well, talking to a friend, dialogue with another person, significant other, leading a group, uh, talking to a mentor, professor, resident, being a resident assistant has helped me, my family, my mom specifically. So you can see how that happens. Okay, so conversations with peers, got it. Mentors, got it. Family members, maybe some contemplative practices, prayer, internal sense, having you know, checking in with the Holy Spirit, times of silence, reading, formal speaking. And then I divide those into a larger category: spiritual disciplines and relationships. Um, and so both of these were two areas that I wanted to explore further. So after the open-ended questionnaire, remember this is grounded theory, so I'm letting the research impact me to do something else. Okay, so I wanted to explore this further. Is this really what's going on? Are, are the people in our lives impacting us in a way where space to process is really so much more prominent than getting specific direction? I also wanted to know, okay, Relationships and spiritual disciplines seem to have some equal weight to them. That was really interesting to me. I wanted to explore it further. And so what I did with all of the seven questions from the open-ended questionnaire was I got all these charts and graphs, and then I said, okay, now I'm going to do some focus groups with these students. And so I had eight students that were willing to do focus groups with me. And so I had two focus groups of four, and we dove in, and we once again coded and counted. And from that process, we were able to derive some principles and themes as to how students were taking ownership of their faith. And so, without further ado, here are the four cat here are the four principles. So if you flip over to the back of your page, you can see these. So the principles generated were, were, were these four things. The first one, and they're kind of in a sequential order, but the last one is kind of the penal, like the kind of the, the big one. So um, but the first one is that painful experiences in crisis lead to faith exploration. When I asked that, four, that fourth question that, that you got about life changes or, or life turns um, or events in your life that, that caused you to think critically about your faith or, 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 or were impactful to your or turning points in your faith journey, um, painful experiences came up a lot. Um, when I sat down with the focus groups and I asked them, okay, tell me about some experiences that you've had that have been impactful, I mean, we just we went right into pain. And we, we, there was some heavy, heavy stuff. Um, a lot, it was really fascinating, there's, a, there's another research practice that needs to be done on this because what I found was that it was the breakdown of significant relationships. It was parents, um, it was youth pastors that left the church, parents getting divorced, it was, the, it was suicide of people close to us that forced us into these big questions about our faith, about our identity, about who we were, how could a good God allow these kinds of things to happen. A lot of these major, major events um, were a part of the beginning of this process. Um, and so these experiences led to a time of faith exploration. The second thing is that anger had to be honestly embraced. Um, what I found was really interesting is that they, were, they had two responses to their pain. One was, well, some people told me just to pray about it or read a passage of scripture and it would all be fine. Or that God was good and was working all things to good and that was meant to make me feel better. But then there were other people in my life who allowed me to get angry about it and allowed me to be just, just ticked off, okay? And, and those were the relationships, those were the experiences that allowed me the safety and, the, and the, the vulnerability to be in the midst of this journey. And so anger needs to be honestly embraced. The third thing, the third thing, is that we need to be able to re-engage spiritual disciplines with the support of community. You remember how I talked about how relationship and spiritual disciplines kind of had equal weight when it came to the thing, the resources in our life? I wanted to find out what, what was going on there. And what I found out, this was really fun, because this is one of those things where the, the, it emerges from the data, it emerges from the process that I was really excited about, is I asked them, okay, I said, relationships and, and spiritual disciplines have equal weight. What's going on there? Like, tell me more about that. And what was really fun is they said, well, the spiritual disciplines were really important. But it was when I prayed and then told someone about the prayer and how God was either answering or not answering. It was when I read my Bible, but then we talked about it in a small group. It was when I went to church and I heard a pastor say something, but then afterwards we went out to lunch and we talked about it. And so I was like, so what I hear you saying is that it's spiritual disciplines done in relationship that allows you to process. And everyone was like, yes, 100%. And so you can see how the funneling of uh, the, how the data was derived allowed for there to be an emphasis not just on spiritual disciplines but spiritual disciplines within a supportive community. That became a, a huge factor in this. Is, but, it, but there was a real emphasis on like moments of, of prayer that really were 
were, were kind of life-giving or got my faith back on track or being in a worship experience that was, that was life-changing. And then finally, this is the big one, process-oriented relationships are essential. I mentioned earlier that there was kind of this like uh, two-thirds, one-third breakdown of, of why spiritual partners were impactful. Two-thirds said process-oriented and a third said it was specific direction. When we got into the uh, focus groups, this, the, the specific direction fell away really quickly and it was all negative when it came to those things. They talked about them because that was what happened, but when they, we asked about well, were they meaningful and were they, were they, how did they change you, the, the specific direction fell away and it was all about the people that allowed them space to process and to ask questions and to think critically. Um, and so the big question for me then becomes, what do we do with this information? What do we do with it? How do we make it change us? How does it impact us personally? And how does it impact the way we help others in their faith development? So how can we begin or continue to see our times of pain and crisis as a catalyst for faith exploration? Secondly, how can we help others process their faith? What are specific phrases or ideas we can use to help others? I want you to think about this and, and, and take it with you and, and, and dwell on it. Let me give you a couple really simple ones. When students come into my office and they have a question about their faith, my first response is to say, oh, this is what I did. Because that creates a level three of Fowler, externally driven reliability. Instead, it's, oh, that's a fascinating question. What do you think? Or, that's a really great question. Tell me why you're asking. Because now I'm diving into their story. Now I'm already getting into what they're thinking, and I'm encouraging their internal voice as opposed to them just understanding mine. And then third, what is the step that you can take in order to develop your own faith journey or to come alongside someone else? So what's the first thing? And maybe take, take a moment as we finish up today and just write down, what is one thing I can do? Is it maybe coming to talk to a campus pastor? Is it talking to a professor? Is it maybe sitting down with a roommate and asking them a challenging question about their faith journey or just asking to hear their story? Like, Tell me your story. I'd love to hear more about it. That way we can understand better and encourage each other as we develop an internal voice. So... We're out of time. I really appreciate you guys coming to this. Um, if you want to connect for coffee or to have more conversation, or if you have any questions, you're welcome to email me or stop by the office across the hall. But um, thank you for being here, and thanks for uh, listening to my research.